with that said, we're going to be looking today at verses 18 through 24 here in the book of Ephesians. And as mentioned, we will uh, we'll com- conclude our study. So I'll begin reading at verse 18. Actually, I won't. I'll start at verse 17 just to carry everything in, in context. And so I'll start at verse 17, read to verse 24, and uh, look at this passage with you today. Paul says, take, this, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak, but that you also may know my affairs and how I'm doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. And so we're going to conclude our study on spiritual warfare as well as our study of the book of Ephesians. And we're going to be looking at first, and I'm going to spend some time looking at the importance of prayer. Now, we've been looking at the armor that have been supplied, has been supplied to us, and you might ask yourself, how can prayer be part of that kind of armor? Well, prayer is incredibly important when it comes to spiritual warfare. Prayer is of utmost importance in the spiritual life of a Christian. In spiritual warfare, it's the source of strategy uh, in which warfare is fought. God's directions and God's presence and God's power is manifested when his children pray. We have to remember we have an enemy. He's unseen, and he's in constant opposition to the the work of God, and, and that's why we call on the Lord for God's direction and God's help. In Psalm 50, verse 15, it says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Now, in the book of Daniel, in chapter 10, I might remind you of this, Daniel had been given a revelation, and as he had been given this revelation, it had troubled him. So for three weeks, he fasted and he prayed, and he was seeking understanding concerning the message. And it seemed like he would never gain that understanding. He wanted to know what this message, what this revelation was all about. Well, the Bible tells us that one day he was standing by the Tigris River, and it was there an angel spoke to him. This visit terrified him. And so the Bible speaks of how he fell to the ground, and he was motionless. And the angel spoke in a comforting way to him and told him, stand up. So in Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 through 14, he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So we have an insight into spiritual warfare. We have an insight that that Daniel had received a revelation. It troubled him. He sought the Lord for an answer. But for three weeks, according to earth time, if you will, There was opposition to that. We have an unseen enemy who is constantly opposing God's work through us. Now, there are those who don't understand what prayer is. and In many ways, they look at at prayer as kind of like just a a religious ritual. They, They repeat certain words. They have a formula, and they think that that is prayer. Jesus taught us not to pray in this fashion. He actually introduced his followers to a different dimension of prayer. When you read the Bible, and this is interesting enough for me to share this with you for a moment. When you read your Bible in the Old Testament, God is identified to us through various titles and attributes. So in the original language, you'll you'll see this. In the English, 
very often it's not, it's not as clear, but in the original language it is. And so there are names or titles that, uh, titles that, are, uh, that, that are in reference to God. For example, he is called Adonai in uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. The word Adonai means Lord or Master. He's called Elohim. And Elohim is actually what is called a plural word. It, it, it speaks of power, and it speaks of authority. It's a word that's used over 2,500 times. And you see it first in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, when it says, in the, be in the beginning, God. In the beginning, Elohim. It speaks of the plurality. It, it represents the trinity. And, and it's a word that, that implies that God is the strongest one and has all authority. So you have Adonai. You have Elohim. You have other words like they're, they're composite words like El Shaddai, the Almighty God. You have El Elyon, the Most High God. You have El Olam, the Everlasting God. He's called Jehovah, the one who brings all things into existence, the self-existing one. This word Jehovah is used 5,321 times in the Old Testament. From Jehovah come the compound names that speak of his character and his attributes. He's Jehovah Elohim, the Lord our God. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. He is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. He is the one who unites us under that banner. He is also our savior, the one who rescues us, the one we identify with. He's called Jehovah Shalom, the Lord my peace. Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord my shepherd. Jehovah Tzitkanu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. He is Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. And all of those are words that are intended to give us insight into the great God that we serve. So these descriptions, as you look at them, reveal God as righteous, as powerful, as majestic, as present. He's also referred to and described as a warrior. He's our provider. He's our healer. He is a protector. He's our shepherd. And so you have all of these Old Testament uh, descriptions of our God, but Jesus introduced us to something that is much more tender and much more personal. You see, when we are born again, God is our Father. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, when Jesus was speaking concerning prayer and was giving a model of prayer, he started it by saying, in this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven. You see, in the Old Testament, God was revealed as loving and caring, but he is not revealed as a personal father. He's a father in the sense that he originates all things. He's a father in the sense that he creates all things. That's what Isaiah points to in chapter 64, verse 8, when he says, But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. And we are all the work of your hand. So he's spoken of as the creator. But in the New Testament, it's the Lord Jesus who introduced us to the knowledge that God is our father. And that takes place when we're born again. In John chapter 1, verse 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. We become children of God when we commit our lives in faith to Jesus Christ. So we are not automatically his children. By creation, he could be spoken of as a father of all things. But in a personal way, he's a father of those who have bowed their knee to Christ. He's a father of those who have received. To as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe on his name. That's how I got saved. Now, coming out of that hippie revolution and all, I was brainwashed into believing we're all children of God. And we used to say that. So we'd say to each other, brother or sister or whatever. You know, we'd just use that. I'd say, hey, brother, and then I'd rip him off of his dope and stuff like that. I mean... <laughs> So he really wasn't my brother at all. So we used that because that was kind of a cool thing to say, and we wanted to point out that we we're all a family united and this and that. No, you become a child of God when you receive Christ as Lord and Savior. That's how you're born again into the family of God. In Galatians 3.26, in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So as Christians, we know prayer is a conversation between a father and and his child. And the Bible is uh, so beautiful when it, it gives to us the insight that we're actually invited to approach God, to come to him with our requests. In, uh, in the past, 
I was uh, given opportunity on a few occasions to go and have um, meetings with uh, either the president or with um, his representatives. And we'd go to Washington, D.C. And it was one of the few times that I would wear a suit. I had to. And so you had to go through all these security things. I mean, we got a call from, from some representative of, I think, the FBI or something like that. They did a background on me. And then you go and you have to go through these different checks to get in, and you finally make it into the room, and you sit there, and then they ultimately will introduce the President of the United States, and you have this, uh, this, this time with him. I don't have to make appointments to see my God. I, I don't have to go through security checks. He's already given me security. He's already cleansed me. He's given me a right to approach him. And that's beautiful when you think about it. Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us come with confidence to God's throne, because God is willing to receive us. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So God does this because God cares for us. God is our father. We are his child. And so having that knowledge, well, that should encourage us to pray. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7, what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon him? Psalm 17, verse 6, I call on you, O God, for you will answer me, give ear to me, hear my prayer. He invites us to do that. Our life is really supposed to be a walking prayer. In spiritual warfare, and we all endure it daily in one form or another, the battle can become hard, as we know. And when it becomes hard, we, we can lose heart. So Paul's instruction is pray always with all prayer and supplication notice, in the spirit. In Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. He said it like this. He said be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. One of the things that Satan can tempt us in. Is to give up. One of the ways that he works. And all of us are familiar with this. If you're a new Christian. You're familiar with it already. If you've been walking with the Lord as a seasoned saint. Uh, you're familiar with this. Uh, one of the things that he repeatedly will whisper somehow, and there's a variety of ways to do it, whisper to us is, is this, give up. It's useless. God doesn't care. You're not important enough for him to care about. There are other things out there that he does, and you're not one of them. And the enemy can whisper that in your ear, and our hearts can respond to that. He does it in a variety of ways. We may have a, a memory that somehow is stirred up by a song we hear on the radio or we talk to an old friend or we may see a picture of something that we can. These things, he, he uses a variety of tools and you know what I mean. You'll be just doing fine. You're driving. You say, well, I'm going to listen to some music. You turn on the radio, an old song comes on, some song that you associate with a, an old friend, we'll say a girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. And all of a sudden, your mind is tripping on down there, and you're remembering some things that maybe hurt you in the past. You know, so you drive over to their house and shoot them. That's what you should do. <laughs> Just seeing if you're listening. But he does that. He does that. There are things that occur, things that happen, that remind you of things that you don't want to remember. There are times when you ask the Lord, God, can you help me in this? And it seems like the heavens are brass and that Lord's, the Lord's ear is deaf to you. And the enemy can say, give up. Why are you even asking? It's not that important. But it is. That's why his exhortation is pray always. That's to be our habit. That's our way of life. It's like he said in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Uh, prayer is, is an ongoing thing. I, I, sometimes we think it, it's only a time where we're going to have a night of prayer or a season of prayer or a day of prayer or a prayer meeting. Prayer is, is at all moments, at any time. 
I, my, I've discovered that, and I discovered it just by being a Christian, that I found myself speaking a lot to the Lord, just talking about daily things. I don't know what you're like in your prayer life, but I talk to him about pretty much everything. We, we, you know, I, I certainly could be put away if people were to see me. I'm just, but, it, but it's true. You know, I find myself talking to the Lord constantly. It's, it's something that, that we do. And, and it's, it's not like, oh, wait a minute, I need a certain posture. I better get on my knees. I better look up. I better clamp my hands. I better close my eyes. It's not that at all. It's I'm driving, and I'll say, Lord, that guy cut me off. Kill him, Jesus. You know, it's <laughs> things like that, you know. It's daily real life. But you know what I mean. I really do, and so do you. I, I speak to the Lord about friends, about family, about our fellowship about what, it, what, it, what would you have for us, Lord? Where would you take us? What do you, what do you want me to do? I speak to the Lord constantly. I wake up speaking to him. I go to bed at night speaking to him. And sometimes even in my dreams, I find myself praying. It's just real. It's just that pray without ceasing. May it be the habit of your life. You see, when things are going tough and, and you're, you're tempted to give up, persistence reveals faith. A faith that, that God not only hears, but an awareness and belief that he also answers. The enemy wants you to think that he doesn't care, that God has no time for you, so he can discourage you. So what do you do while well, you remain steadfast? It's like when my children were small. If they wanted something, they let me know, and they would also remind me of my promises. How many parents here have ever heard the words, you said, <laughs> you said. They remember my promises. Daddy, you said, you're going to, you said. And you know, they, they, they knew that their father could do anything. They thought in their mind, at least. But that's the child, right? Your, your father can do anything. Back in a long time ago, let me give you a history lesson. I look out there. I'm looking for some gray hair. Some of you will remember this. <laughs> when Disneyland was built in the 50s, 55, I lived in Norwalk. Anaheim was only 15-minute drive away. And Disneyland was opened. Man, that was every kid's dream, to go to Disneyland. And so one day, my, my mom said to me, we have a surprise for you. And so I said, great, we're little. I still remember my brother and me being put in the back seat of the car, and, but it was raining. It was pouring. We didn't know what the surprise was. And it was raining. And so we were supposed to go to Disneyland, but instead, my dad took us to go see my aunt. Talk about Mickey Mouse, you know, so we, <laughs> I thought my dad was goofy, and so we, we went, so we're driving, and, and we're going to Venice, she lived in Venice, Santa Monica area, so we, we, there was a, there used to be this hamburger stand that was a big thing, again, I grew up in a time when junk food you, when you went to a, get a hamburger or something, that was a real treat. That you know, we never did. That was a treat, and so he stopped and bought us a hamburger. And when we got to my aunt's house, we walked into the house, and it started snowing. It hadn't snowed in California for all you know, all of my life, all five years of it, and <laughs> we thought my dad made it snow. We said, "Thank you, Daddy." Thank you for your surprise. Thank you. And he took credit for it, too. <laughs> it was only until much later that my mom said, we were actually going to take you to Disneyland, but it, it rained, but you thought Dad made it snow, so we just, left, we just left that alone, right? But every kid believes, almost every kid believes their daddy can do anything. Well, guess what? Our Father can. And that, that's what we're supposed to believe. That's what we're supposed to know, that my, my God is able. So prayer and supplication is, is to be my way of life. When he speaks concerning prayer, by the way, that, uh, the word prayer in this context speaks of general requests. When he speaks of supplication, 
praying always with all prayer and supplication, verse 18. That, the word supplication speaks of specific requests. Like in Philippians 4 again, verse 6, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and let your requests be made known to God. And so we pray. We, we, we have our general requests that we give to the Lord, but we also make those specific ones. And we notice verse 18, and we do it when he says praying always in the spirit. Spiritual strength and courage are needed in spiritual warfare and difficult times. Again, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, Paul said it like this. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. You see, the battle is not against flesh and blood, as he's already said, because that, that, that would be a natural battle. We're in a spiritual war, and therefore our weapons need to be spiritual. Standing ready for combat is combined with prayer. When he's speaking with this, it, it reveals a mindset that we know that we're engaged in warfare. And it also reveals how the armor we wear is to be taken. We're to be aware that we're not fighting a natural force. It's a supernatural enemy that we have. And so my life is to be aware that I've actually been taken into the family of God. There is an opposition, an unseen enemy who strategizes how he may destroy. The attitude of a Christian's life is constant prayer. And in this way, we maintain our dependence on God constantly. Our prayerfulness is what fuels our actions as we act on the word of God. You see, in prayer, the Holy Spirit leads us in the direction he would have us to go. There have been so many times that in my own spiritual life, I, I will be at a, at a crossroads and, 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 and I'll hesitate because I don't know, do I go to the left, do I go to the right? And I have to take that to God in prayer. I, I, I wait on the Lord and I say, Father, what would you have us to do? What would you have me to do? Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5 says it like this. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. You see, again, there are times when we're under attack. We don't know what to do. So Paul gives words of comfort in Romans 8, 26 and 27. He says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. There are times when I don't know exactly how to pray, so I just wait on the Lord, knowing that the Holy Spirit within me makes groanings to the Lord. And the Lord will give me an answer. Again, the enemy wants you to believe that there's no way out of your circumstances. But there always is a way with the Lord. When our church was young, it was only a few months old. We decided to have a, an alternative, an alternative uh, for Halloween. We were not going to celebrate Halloween, but we had small kids. We wanted to give them something to do, so we, we had our first Hallelujah Night. It was as an alternative. We only had like 15 kids in the church, and um, three of them were mine. Well, when the church that we were renting heard that we were going to have a hallelujah party, they, they, they told us we were demonic. You're, you, you, worshiped, you worshiped the devil because you're celebrating Halloween, and we weren't doing that at all. It was, a, it was an alternative. And so they kicked us out of the church. We didn't have any place to go. We only had 60 people at that time. We didn't have any place to go. And so I had two assistants at that time, Randy Walls, who's the pastor of Calvary Upland, and Dan Renshaw, who's the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Clay Allen, Washington. And we started scouring through the entire city of Ontario, even went up to, to, to uh, Upland looking for a place because uh, we had been kicked out. We couldn't afford the uh, rent that uh, any other places that we discovered 
uh, would charge us. We were only paying $150 a month for the rent on this, ch this church. We used it on Sundays. And we had a small office um, in Ontario that cost us like $100 a month. We didn't have anything. We didn't have money. We had 60 people. We didn't have the, the, uh, the ability to rent somewhere. And so a month goes by. We're into the second month. He, they've told us you have to be out by, by um, January, the end of January. And I didn't know what to do. I can still remember we were about to get kicked out. It was in January. And I had written a, a letter to my, to my pastor, Chuck Smith, and I had said to Chuck, um, because we used to call ourselves uh, Ontario Christian Chapel. I think that's what we called ourselves at that time. And I said, Chuck, I'd like to be part of the Calvary Chapel family, and, and I'd like to associate as a Calvary. And so I had done that twice. I uh, actually uh, contacted Costa Mesa twice. Once I got a phone call saying, no. Second time I got a phone, I didn't even get a response. So I went straight to pastor and I said, Chuck, this is who I am. This is what we're doing. This is what I'd like. And I'm asking, well, now we're kicked out. My men have gone through the entire city. I've gone through the entire city. We couldn't afford any place other than central school. Central school was the only thing open. But we didn't have the money. They, we were paying um, $150 a, a month, and they wanted $1,050. We, we didn't have that kind of money. I still remember falling on my face, literally not crashing down, but hitting my knees and putting my face on the carpet in my, my bedroom. My wife and my kids were gone for some reason, and, and I cried. I cried. I just cried out to the Lord. I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know how. God, this is beyond anything I can do. I need your help. We've been looking. We can't find anything. We can't afford anything. We didn't receive offerings or anything like that. We didn't receive offerings in this church for 11 years. I wanted God to do what God wanted to do. And so I remember going to the Wednesday night. It was a Wednesday night study and I remember going in, and one of the women looked at me, and she said, you look like death warmed over. She said, you need prayer. We need to pray for you. Because my eyes were swollen. I was just, I was at the end. And I do remember saying, well, at, at the conclusion of the study, please. So we put two chairs in the center, my friend Dan and I, and they prayed, God, do something. Well, the next day, I was preparing a study out of John's Gospel, John 12, 24, if a grain of wheat fall into the ground, uh, it, it's going to be alone unless it dies. If it dies, it produces much fruit. And I remember saying to the Lord, I am dead. And as I said that, the mailman came up. Oh, I ought to add this. When I got home from Wednesday night, I was laying about to go to sleep, and I heard a voice. It was like an audible voice, yet it was internally audible. I don't know how to explain it. But the voice said, you will need a place to seat 200 people on Easter Sunday. And we had 60 people in the church. But I remember just saying, that's right. I went to sleep. Well, the next day, I'm, I'm on the couch, and I'm preparing a study, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And I said... Father, I'm dead. And as I was saying, I am dead, the mailman came walking up, and the voice again, the same voice, repeated and said to me this time, your letter is here. So I went and picked up the mail and put it down on the table and, and turned over the very first one, and it said, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And I opened it up, and that's a letter. We have a copy of it, part of that letter in the hallway. You can read it. It was from Pastor Chuck. And he said, we welcome you to the Fellowship of Calvary Chapel. And so that Saturday, we, had, we used to have all church breakfasts. We didn't have men's breakfasts and women's. We just, you hungry? Let's go out. So we did. And so I announced we've been uh, received into the Fellowship of Calvary Chapel. And within a month and a half, they gave us an extension at the end of, of um, January. 
And then on Easter Sunday, it was raining and pouring so bad. But as I stood there, I looked out at an auditorium. We had 60 people in our church. There were 200 people in that auditorium. And I said, you don't know this, but you are an answer to what God put in my heart a couple months ago. And that was when the Lord, I can tell you many stories. I'm not going to make this storytelling night, but I can tell you many stories like that where the Holy Spirit has said, you hold fast. I'll give you one more because I, 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 I like to. Uh, we didn't have it was it, it, you know in churches it, it, I'm, and no I'm not receiving an offering but these are things that the Lord has taught me we, we needed to get some property the school that we were renting kicked us out of it. And they said, we want our school back. We had been renting Ontario Christian Elementary. They were very good to us, but it was time for us to leave. We looked for some property, and we found some in Maple Street in Ontario. And so the property at that time was $780,000. It could have been $780 million. We didn't, we didn't have the finances. But... We sought the Lord and were able to work it out so that, and I can't remember the details, but we were able to, to qualify for a $600,000 loan. And so I, I, I said, Father, I don't know what we're going to do because we don't have the money, and I'm not a pastor who goes and starts telling people, you need to give because my God shall supply all my need. And I believe that you do. But Father, I don't know what to do. And once again, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said to me, uh, I did not raise you up to let you fall. I did not raise you up to let you fall. Long story made short, I, in, with tears, I didn't want to, I went and spoke to my pastor and uh, sat down with him. And, and I said to him, Pastor, I, I could prob probably get a loan from an organization, but I don't want them to say, I made Calvary Chapel rich. So I'm speaking to you. And we need $180,000 to close a deal. And Chuck looks at me and he says, $180,000? That's not that much. And I looked at Chuck, I said, to you? <laughs> but to me? And uh, he said, let me speak to the board. And so... Pastor Chuck gave us a loan for $180,000, and that's how we were able to get our Maple Street. We paid him off like in a year, because I don't like to owe people anything. And so even my pastor, we paid him off in a year. And so the Lord has shown, it, shown us that so many times, so many times. I wish I could tell you more stories, because uh, these, these are not just normal things. They have, these are spiritual wars where God wants to do a work and the enemy wants to stop it. And, 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 but no, I know the Lord wants, God help us. And I, I, 41 years, I can give you so many stories of how he has been faithful every step of the way. Even when we moved in here, my administrator, for some reason, didn't tell me that we needed $100,000, that we were short. He didn't tell me that for some reason. But, and we didn't receive offerings. And we needed to have $100,000 in three weeks. And within three weeks, without receiving offerings, we received more than that $100,000 on top of the regular. God is able. He provides. I am telling you, that's just, just, a, that's just the truth. And, and it may seem, I'm only speaking of these things, you need to understand that, that, that a building is a place where the sheep get fed and sent out for ministry. And there's an importance to it. So it wasn't material things I was concerned about. It was a place to feed the sheep. And that's what the Lord has done over and over again. And again, I could share you many things about that, but I better move on because we're going to receive communion. So I'm only in verse 18. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 
So we pray being watchful with perseverance and supplication. We pray keeping our mind on what is occurring as well as our request. We're aware that distractions occur that would keep us from prayer. So we keep our mind on what we're asking of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 6, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch and be sober. So we pray with perseverance and supplication. Notice for all the saints, he says, and he says, for me. So church, he's saying, pray for all the believers. Become less self-centered. Pray for your brothers. Pray for your sisters. But he goes on in verse 19, and for me, that utterance may be given to me. Utterance, that speaks of speech that is filled with wisdom and understanding. It, it speaks of spirit-inspired speech that is precise and anointed. It, it, it's more than simply the capacity to speak clearly. It, it's a request that God will fill his words with spiritual insight and power. In 1 Corinthians 12, 8, to one there is given through the spirit a word of wisdom, to another a word of knowledge by means of the same spirit. So Paul is praying that God will give through his speech insight and wisdom not just human wisdom, but insight from heaven. Notice he's in prison. He's in prison, but he's requesting prayerful boldness. He wants spiritual power to flow through his words. And again, that's the heart of a true minister. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. Colossians 4, 3, Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. So preaching and teaching places you in a position of open attacks. Correcting, pe correcting people's beliefs can cause anger. Exposing error results in attacks. And the result is attacks on the minister, the one who does so. Matthew 26, 31, strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So we pray for boldness when we share God's message because it's natural and it's easy to be intimidated. In Jeremiah 1, 4 through 9, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces. I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand, touched my mouth. The Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. If you want to be bold, you pray and say, God, increase my boldness. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Here am I, Lord. I'm willing to speak as, as, an, as a 23-year-old, 24-year-old. In 23, I went to Bible college. and At the age of 24, I went to secular college. Bible college is a lot different than secular. And so Bible college, you can speak about Christ. Secular college, you better be ready. You better be ready for the onslaught. I'm a new Christian, but I made a decision at that age. I said to the Lord, if nobody else will speak, I will. I will speak for you. I want to be courageous. I want to be open. I want to be bold. I want to do that. And so I've, I've been doing that from the time I was 23 years old, speaking of the Lord. Even before that, in the army at the age of 20 and 21, 21 and 22, I, 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 I was open to speak about Jesus. I told people about the Lord. Why? Because you need to. And yes, you can be afraid of the reactions. And yes, people, people get upset. But our call is to speak the truth in love. And he wants to speak, notice verse 19, the mystery of the gospel. I want to clearly reveal God's grace in Jesus to both Jew and Gentile. He says in verse 20, I am an ambassador in chains. I need to speak boldly. I'm bound by a chain to a soldier, but I'm really chained to Jesus. In 2 Timothy 2, 8 and 9, it says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. So in spiritual war, we pray for courage and wisdom. And finally, verses 21 through 24, I'll summarize and close. But that you may 
that, uh, but that you also may know my affairs, how I'm doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So a couple of things and we'll close. He speaks of Tychicus. This is a man who is his envoy, his messenger. Tychicus is mentioned in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. He's from Asia, modern Turkey. In 2 Timothy 4, 12, he speaks of Tychicus. Colossians 4, 7, once again. And also in Titus chapter 3, verse 12. Paul speaks of him as a beloved brother and notice a faithful minister. So as a faithful minister, Paul had the highest regard and trust for him. So as an envoy, he's bringing news about Paul to help them to pray for Paul. And his news is intended to bring comfort to their hearts. And finally, he closes with verses 23 and 24, and he speaks concerning peace, love, and faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these things come from Jesus Christ. And these are the things that belong to those who love the Lord, who love the Lord. Notice this in sincerity, verse 24. When he says, who love the Lord, let me close with this thought. The word sincerity, I looked that up. I wanted to know. It means incorruptibility. It speaks of that which is genuine, but it speaks also of that which is unending. Incorruptible, genuine, and unending. Grace to those who have an imperishable love for Jesus Christ. That's how he closed it. Grace to those, love to those who have an imperishable love for Jesus Christ. May God may God ignite our hearts with love for Christ, with a willingness to be counted, with the courage to stand up, with an understanding to be able to explain and a boldness to hold fast in the face of opposition. Because the world is going to hell in a handbasket, it's time for the church to stand up and be counted. May we speak in the name of Jesus. Why? Because we have an unending, imperishable love for him.